Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you also to the um, Africa Center for Strategic uh, Studies. I'm, I'm always honored to be in front of uh, distinguished uh, sister and brother members of parliament, especially from the African continent. Um, and my, both of my parents are from Ethiopia, so I believe Ethiopia is represented here. So, salam um, tanasaldin. And so it's an honor to, um, to, to, to get a chance to really talk to you um, uh, today about uh, some practical ways to really uh, build trust with your citizenry. Um, and I really appreciate the comments from, from Dr. Chris and, and JT as well. And so what I'd like to do is run through a, uh, some slides. First, let me just tell you who I am. I'm the Vice President of Policy Analysis and Research at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I will share stories of how uh, caucuses have been evolving and taking shape on the Hill. Um, and I would love to know if that's uh, something that could be implemented or has already been uh, taking shape on um, in your respective um, positions. Uh, and, uh, you know, Congress is an ever evolving project of democracy and representation. And so, uh, as a political scientist, I say data analysis policy is important and also symbolics and, you know, symbolis symbolic representation. Uh, you know, even if nothing comes of it, uh, the effort that you all show to represent your viewpoints, your districts, your, con your, your countries, your uh, various viewpoints. It, it, it has value, and so it is important. As I thought about my remarks today, I, I often think about lessons learned. Um, so for those you don't know, actually, uh, you know, we've, uh, since 1776, we've been trying to get it, get it right, and uh, we have specialized and evolved over time. So I'll talk a little bit about how committee started with, you know, just three way back <laughs> then, uh, and now uh, we have standing committees and, um, and even caucuses now that I, I'm very fascinated with, and we'll talk to you a little bit about them. Um, uh, but uh, none, nonetheless, uh, y y y the CBCF itself, by the way, um, was created in 1976, um, and it is a nonpartisan, non-profit uh, institute. That's where I work. Um, we uh, we work in very close cooperation with the Congressional Black Caucus, which is would be sort of your counterparts, and uh, they are uh, it's a bipartisan caucus. Um, I like to mention CBCF was created. Uh, in 1976, due in part uh, tremendously to the spouses of the CBC members. So the black members of Congress, many of the wives were very instrumental as their husbands were representing. They were also, too, assisting um, in ensuring that these um, uh, spaces were created. And so I, I lift that up to, to, to ask uh, if uh, something similar, again, could be, um, it is, is perhaps taking shape in terms of uh, organizing around representing interests. Um, and because of that, I have a job at the CBCF, and we uh, focus on various policy issues and serve as a resource of information for various members of Congress. Uh, this slide is, is, is just around you know, the issues that you all uh, are dealing with, and we are here to you, too in, um, in, in terms of ensuring that um, you are setting policy that is uh, safeguarding the citizenry, but also following the law. And as I mentioned, it is uh, we have um, a very robust military intelligence a you know, apparatus, uh, and, and we are uh, continuously, especially since 9-11, uh, finding innovative ways uh, to make sure that we do uh, a robust job of um, combating and confronting uh, some of the you know modern day threats uh, while at the same time making sure that we're abiding by the law. So there really isn't any codified written uh, statute uh, that gives uh, congressional oversight, but it is an implied power and it is utilized by all members of Congress. Uh, committees themselves are oversight, uh, arms of oversight, uh, but so too is the Congressional uh, Committee on Oversight and Reform. There are dedicated institutional platforms that are specifically to address uh, problems to keep checks and balances in order. And because those institutions are created, uh, when um, investigations are launched, when research is conducted uh, on a member or group of members or the executive branch, it is not seen as a personal attack, but as a reflection of the responsibility of that various committee. And so building symbolic institutions and substantive institutions that give members of, of, of Congress themselves uh, some cover, uh, instead of making it uh, sort of a personal, uh, personalized, I'm going to go against this person or that, uh, you know, there are codified statutes that, um, that have responsibilities for, um, for making sure you can bring these investigations forward. 
So in terms of execution of oversight, uh, what do we mean when we say oversight? It's everything from uh, the responsibilities of the committee uh, on, on oversight to authorization and appropriations. Every step of the democratic process, uh, finalizing the budget, they all entail some various uh, level of, of oversight and consensus on, on and, and, and disagreement, right? I mean, we talked about the budget. You know, the president's budget comes out in February here every year, uh, but the president doesn't have the authority to, to pass the budget. Budget, right? It is a symbolic document, but it gives a lot of cues to where the administration is um, on key issues where they f they would like Congress to be, but the ultimate authority to uh, pass the budget uh, lies with Congress. And so, uh, you know, again, symbolics is, is important as well. And um, you have arms of, uh, of, of, of research like the Congressional Research uh, Service and my colleagues here who also support the work of ensuring that uh, members of Congress have uh, the ability and authority and information and historical context to make informed policy decisions. Um, and so there are reviews and studies by congressional support agencies and staff that take place every day and employ thousands of people to do just this work. Um, uh, in terms of the apparatus of military agencies, you all are aware of this. Um, it's not new to you, but I, I mention it because these are institution institutions that are uh, that you know were once not there but they are there and they are specialized around um, different uh, sort of sectors of national security uh, oversight uh, and implementation and so uh, they are uh, varied and wide but you're you're looking at um, the main the main four um, and and they do have uh, different responsibilities. So when you're looking in terms of Central Intelligence Agency, for us, you're conducting foreign uh, covert operations. Uh, the DIA is concentrating on foreign military intelligence uh, information, and of course, the NSA uh, is looking at um, sort of. Uh, information and breaking codes and intercepting communications from abroad. They all work um, together, uh, but it's important to not just see national security uh, into the points of my colleagues as this sort of broad um, based uh, strategy. It needs to be customized, targeted, and, and specialized. Um, and so that's um, how it works here. And of course, in terms of all the operations, even outside of uh, secure, national security, the GAO. Uh, there's no stranger to anyone in Congress or anyone who studies Congress. The Government Accountability Office gets federal money to ensure checks and balances and oversight of all legislative activity in Congress. And their core values, as you can see, integrity, accountability, reliability, these words matter. Uh, but what they're doing to impl implement them matter more. Um, and they also, too, are specialized across different sectors, right? And so uh, since uh, 1921, they have been ex in existence. And you may have heard we refer to GAO as the watchdog, right? Um, and, and they are mandated sometimes to create uh, in, uh, reports uh, at the end of the session, analyze the work that members of Congress are engaged in and ensure that they're doing their job because uh, it's everyone is clear that legislation and implementation are not the same thing. And so GAO stands in the, in the gap there um, and uh, is a respected and reputable source. But this is also, these are arms of, of resource information that allow members of Congress to do their job. Um, and the same is true for other representatives like your Self, um, you know, we have been paying close attention in the current Congress um, to the Congressional Oversight and Reform Committee. Um, I work very closely with, um, particularly, the Black members of the United States Congress. Uh, this year, we're excited this session of Congress that there are uh, key committee chair positions that are held by Black members of Congress, like the Oversight Committee. So, Congressman Elijah Cummings, um, who um, oversees that committee with, with Republicans and Democrats. Um, have been very busy uh, this year uh, with holding uh, hearings that are open to the public. Um, and uh, they are also symbolic at the same time uh, they provide um, information and opportunity for members to then ask questions and engage with experts uh, while uh, the public is watching. And so um, they too have specialized across subcommittees. And so um, you can see the um, various subcommittees that exist within the Congressional Oversight uh, Committee. Um, 
And in terms of the National uh, Security uh, Subcommittee of Oversight, uh, because the Democrats are in the House, uh, Congressman Lynch is, is the subcommittee uh, chair, and, and they have here, so they are telling you what they do, right? It is, uh, we're in a digital age, it's important to use media and technology to spread information and do it in very succinct, clear ways. Um, these, uh, and so they say, the Subcommittee on National Security, which shall have oversight jurisdiction over national security, homeland security, foreign operations, including the relationships of the United States with other nations, immigration, defense, issues affecting veterans, and oversight and legislative jurisdiction over federal acquisition policy related to national security. Um, uh, it is important to make sure people people know what you do, um, how to find you, um, and to and to make sure um, you know you're very you know clear on when they you know they they have a calendar of the hearings. Uh, you can go to Capitol Hill and walk right in um, and and listen to some of the hearings that are taping taking shape. Just a quick snapshot of the most recent hearings. I believe about 15 have been held since the session started uh, in January on all kinds of topics. Right. Uh, most recently, you, you all have seen that took up the with the Michael Cohen hearings. Uh, there have uh, also been um, hearings with regard to uh, HR one around uh, voting rights and improving the ability of Americans to vote. There have been committee hearings already for examining transparency under the Trump administration. Right. Um, Subcommittee on Civil Rights. You can read the list here. Right. Um, this is really key to representation because it allows us to understand where Congress is at on these issues, what are they listening to, and again, um, these are uh, open here. well, most of them are open hearings. So Congress has specialized mechanisms for congressional oversight, but is that enough to build trust with the citizenry? Um, well, I would say um, there's more to be done, and so what I'd like to do is share a little bit to you on sort of the human, the human side of how Congress operates. Um, I appreciated uh, Chris mentioning how um, you know to use, for instance, uh, under in interns to do the work or bring young people. You all need a pipeline to ensure that, especially in some of your respective countries where the turnover, uh, the incumbency rate is low and the turnover rate of service is very high. And so, who are you um, building uh, up to uh, do the work. At the Con Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, we raise millions of dollars throughout the entire year to put paid undergraduate interns um, on Capitol Hill to assist CBC members and other members of Congress with everyday work. My, my research intern is here with me today, um, but we have several on the Hill that do policy work. Um, they are, we, we also pay them because we understand the sort of racial uh, gaps in which um, socioeconomic status uh, helps a lot of um, folks who don't, who, who have money work on the Hill uh, uh, for free. Uh, but for us, we have an institution at CBCF where we offer paid internships and free housing um, for undergraduates um, to work on the Hill. And by the way, I would say almost a third of Congress it runs off of free labor. Right? There are so many young people that are unpaid because they believe in the strength of representation in Congress. And they're very smart. They answer the constituent calls on the phone. Um, you know, this is a great way uh, to uh, get some help and assistance at a very uh, rudimentary level um, and up until you know, the kinds of expertise you want, partnering with various universities um, and, and colleges, creating opportunities for young people to come and work with you. They would love to be able to do that. Um, and at the same time, you get to benefit benefit from their resources, and Congress operates the same way. Uh, with respect to caucuses, which um, uh, are, are voluntary um, groups that members of Congress only hold on the Hill, uh, it has been very fascinating to watch them evolve over time. I like to say they're analogous to lobby groups. They do the work of, 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 of lobbyists, but with each other, because there's all this policy that they want to represent, and they want to work across partisan lines. They want to work um, with uh, members of a certain committee if they didn't get that committee position. And so caucuses have been fascinating. Many of you are aware of the Congressional Black Caucus, but there are also caucuses around national security, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and so caucuses 
they don't really cost anything. There was a time when caucuses were considered legislative service organizations, and they actually did uh, get money to do um, work on various issues. And then in the 90s, uh, that money was cut. Um, and so uh, what we have seen, though, is a spike in the number of caucuses. That'll be on an another slide here. But uh, caucuses are nothing but issue area information groups. So just imagine uh, some of you in this room get together, you identify um, you know, cybersecurity issues, and you're not on the committee that you want to be on. You may not have the resources to address the issue, but you are committed and passionate, and your representatives want you to be doing something on this issue. So you work um, in me and to create uh, this group among members, and it facilitates relationships um, across the aisle, um, and it also provides uh, an opportunity to uh, really serve as an information source. So they are, there are all kinds of caucuses um, on anything you can imagine. And I like to tell my students, go to the website of a member of Congress, and you'll read their biography and their committee positions. And then there will be this long list of all the caucuses that they are on, the Alzheimer's caucus, the bicycle caucus, the national security caucus, so many caucuses. Not, they may not be active on everything, but they are putting it there so that people like me and everyday citizens can go and say, you know what, I'm a marathon runner, and I don't have anywhere to run in my city, but I see that there is uh, a park caucus, a, a public works caucus, and I want to, um, I feel represented by that group, and um, therefore I'm going to vote for this person the next time around. And it's fascinating watching uh, them evolve over time. I, my research is um, spe specifically on race and ethnic-based caucuses. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but I tried to highlight the caucuses that have been registered this current session of Congress in the 116th Congress that are um, on the continent. Um, and um, throughout this year, throughout the next two years, you will start to see the numbers grow. Um, in fact, um, members of Congress are identifying their own constituents beyond race. Um, they're looking at the uh, increased visibility of immigrants of all races uh, and ethnicities that are a part of the American fabric, and they are building caucuses around there. There's a Macedonian caucus, right? Um, we know there's been an Ethiopian American caucus for a long time, um, and that will continue to, um, uh, uh, to be created. La last year, um, in the la I'm sorry, last session of Congress, uh, by the end of the last session, these were the African caucuses. Uh, I, I forgot to put Cameroon, ca the Cameroon caucus was also created. Um, Congressman Don Payne uh, Jr. created the Congressional African Immigrant, Immigrant and Diaspora Caucus. Okay, so they don't get resources. The members themselves can can give resources if they want, but there are members on both sides of the aisle on all of these issues. So if you're, for instance, part of the Ethiopian diaspora in the United States and you are not in Karen Bass's district, you are not represented by a member who is on the Foreign Affairs Committee, but you really care about what's happening in Ethiopia, well, you have a lot of other members that are saying they're on the Congressional Ethiopian Caucus, so go and ask them what they do. So for your issues where you might not be getting traction, you might not have an opportunity or the resources to represent that issue, you, you, you can create caucuses around the issues that you want to represent and engage citizens with that process when you go uh, uh, home. So with respect to the strongest, some of the strongest examples of caucuses are in fact the, the uh, race-based caucuses of the Congressional Black Caucus chaired by Congresswoman Karen Bass, um, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, chaired by Congressman uh, Joaquin Castro, and the Asian Pacific American Caucus, which is um, chaired by Congresswoman Judy Chu. Um, and again, there are, it's grown over time. In fact, the fact sheet that I gave you uh, were the numbers from January, and they've since kind of uh, grown. So uh, we uh, and the CBC gained nine more new members of Congress uh, that have joined the CBC. The, the, this tri caucus is very powerful. So um, you may create a bicycle caucus, and you may create a park caucus, and right there you may have 30 members of, of your parliament, and you might have another 30, and the two of you can now join together and work on environmental sustainability issues. I know my time is getting short here, but what I want to point out is that over time, um, you have seen, if you look at the far right column, the, how caucuses have multiplied um, in the hundreds. 
um, on every issue that, and they do this because they want to represent the interest. They want to show that in the time they're there, they can deliver. And this is the way that they do that. Um, and there are all kinds of caucuses we can talk about later on, on all kinds of different issues. I do want to quickly show you the National Security Caucuses, which again, very easy to create these caucuses. In fact, uh, for in the United States, it only takes uh, w w taking uh, one form to the Committee on House Administration, telling them you're the chair, the title of the caucus, the members, and there you go, you're a CMO, you can put it on your website and start doing work on it. So with respect to the 616th Congress right now, here are all the National Security Caucuses that exist outside of the uh, Foreign Affairs uh, or Homeland Security Committees, okay, on all kinds of issues. And this allows opportunity for our members to engage outside of their committee. Um, so last slide, just in terms of lessons learned, uh, things you can do uh, within your power is establish specialized institutions uh, of checks and balances with customized approaches of oversight, um, building trust and credibility. Um, they mentioned going to the, to the district. It's important to engage. Use uh, people, don't personalize politics. Use institu build institutions um, and build team, really teams. You know, I follow sports. Build teams among, the, among your colleagues around different issues. And when you build a caucus, say these are the terms of the caucus. We're going to provide an evaluation or report um, on some national security issue and we want to deliver it to the committee. And so you do your monitoring and your evaluation and you give them the report. No one's saying, you know, uh, I co-authored it, you co-authored it. This is the report of the National Security Caucus. This is how this institution thinks, right? So, so, so broaden, um, you know, the, uh, your, your ideas, um, your spaces in that way. Use social media and technology to your advantage. I'd actually like to ask a quick question. Are how many of you um, use social media to communicate with your constituents. Yeah, you should raise them high and loud. Yeah, there you go. Because um, that, that is the wave of the future and creating spaces to have supporters from all over the globe is incredibly important. Um, and I encourage you to continue to do that. So I will end, I will end there and we, with the remaining time we can Thank you so have much, questions. Meta. Sure, no problem. That was wonderful. The caucus is a very important opportunity. Uh,